This week on Adventist News Network, health care for Albania's Roma community. A new budget for the Adventist World Church. And an ongoing threat to religious liberty in Hungary. These stories and more coming up. This is Adventist News Network, a service of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. Thanks for joining us this week. First in the news, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency is impacting Europe's Roma community. The Roma are often discriminated against and struggle to gain basic rights, such as housing, education, and health care. An estimated one out of five Roma children dies before reaching the age of five. Most of them have never seen a doctor. Using a mobile clinic, ADRA is visiting Roma communities in Albania to provide basic medical care, as well as information on disease prevention, nutrition, and hygiene. ADRA also recently distributed face masks and eye drops to thousands of indigenous farmers in Ecuador. The families live at the foot of an active volcano spewing toxic ash across the region. Ecuador's Ministry of Health appealed to ADRA for support when the families chose not to evacuate their homes despite the health hazard. ADRA officials are hoping the face masks will protect residents from volcanic ash particles. The new year means a new budget for the Adventist World Church. The denomination's $167 million budget for 2012 will fund mission work and administrative support outside of North America, as well as the operation of World Church Headquarters in the U.S. state of Maryland. The budget covers operations from World Church Headquarters and does not include church budgets at local administrative levels. World Church under-treasurer Juan Prestol says the church's budget is a testament to the faithfulness of members worldwide. Tithe and mission offerings worldwide have either grown or held steady in recent years. Another hopeful note this year, after years of volatility, the economy is now functioning with what Prestol calls a certain degree of predictability. For more details on the budget, check out the full budget story at news.adventist.org. You can even request a copy of the 2012 budget to review. Sabbath worship for Adventists in the Pacific Island of Samoa has become challenging. On Thursday, December 29, the Pacific Island shifted west of the international date line to match its calendar with chief trade partners Australia and New Zealand. The time warp means Samoans skipped the last Friday of 2011, jumping straight from Thursday to Saturday. This prompted Adventists to decide whether to worship on their calendar's new Saturday or to continue worship on the same seventh day, day of the week, now called Sunday in Samoa. Church members in Samoa say they'll continue worshiping on the same seventh day of each week, despite the day's name change. This isn't the first shift in time for the island nation. In the late 1800s, Samoa jumped to the eastern side of the international dateline to better align with American trade interests. The church's top leader in Euro-Africa is applauding the results of the recent United Nations Climate Change Conference. President Bruno Vertalier says the Adventist Church in the region welcomes efforts to manage God's creation wisely and responsibly. Held this year in Durban, South Africa, the Climate Change Conference will extend measures first introduced by the Kyoto Protocol, which was set to expire in 2012. With a new agreement, industrialized nations will continue to curb greenhouse gas emissions. These emissions are thought by many to contribute to pollution and global warming. The agreement also provides incentives for new investments in technology to fight climate change. The Church in Inter-America has a new Bible Bowl champion. Waylon Johnson is the grand prize winner of the region's annual Youth Bible Bowl. Waylon takes home a trophy an $8,000 scholarship, and an iPad 2. Johnson and 13 other Bible Bowl finalists traveled to Puerto Rico recently to answer questions about the Bible books of Luke and Acts in front of a live audience. Johnson credits his win to prayerful study of the Bible. 
And now we have an update on a story we followed closely in 2011. Many of you recently emailed us to ask for an update on the Adventist Church's status in Hungary. The church was among minority religions threatened late last year when the country's government passed the controversial law of churches. But before the legislation could go into effect, a Hungarian court struck down the law. Despite that initially hopeful news, not much has changed for minority religions in Hungary. The country's ruling party recently reintroduced essentially the same law, and the Adventist Church again faces deregistration. Joining us here in the studio today is Dwayne Leslie. He has advocated for the Adventist Church's status as an official religion in Hungary during this entire process. Dwayne, why was this law so easily reintroduced? Fidesz, which is the conservative majority party in Hungary, they control two-thirds of the seats in Parliament. That overwhelming majority allowed them to easily reintroduce the law after it was overturned on technical grounds and reintroduce it and, and basically have it go into effect the next day. So it was introduced on December 30, went into effect January 1 without any debate. Mm. Now, the Hungarian government has claimed that this law is necessary to weed out groups uh, so that it can st stop from abusing the church's status. What merit does this have? Well, prior to the enactment of this law, there were over 340 recognized churches in Hungary. After this, the law was implemented, only 14 have been accepted. Now, when I met with the Hungarian ambassador recently, he stressed that many of those 340 groups were not really religions. They were groups who were really businesses or individuals operating under the cover of religion. Now, while there's no way to quantify the extent of that claim, uh, the one thing that's important to note is that they've now politicized the process. So not only having an objective standard, but now you have to get a two-thirds vote of parliament just to be approved as an official religion. And we think that that's somewhat problematic. Where does this latest development leave the Adventist Church in Hungary? And what is your role as a religious liberty advocate? Well, as of January 1 of this year, as I mentioned, 14 religions were granted official recognition. However, there are 72 churches that have applied for recognition going forward under this new law, one of which is the Adventist Church. One of the provisions in this new law says that uh, the churches that have applied for status will not lose their status as of January 1 while a decision is pending. Uh, recent reports have shown that uh, members of parliament have suggested that there will be an answer by the end of February, so hopefully our church will have an answer at that point. At this point going forward, we'd really encourage people to pray for our church and pray for our members in Hungary so that we can continue to operate uh, as we have in the past. Thanks, Duane. Just ahead, a homeless Russian woman rises to the highest political post that any Adventist has served in the country. Welcome back. Here's Sandra Blackmer with a preview of two must-read stories from this month's edition of Adventist World. Andrew McChesney, an Adventist journalist living in Russia, authored this month's Adventist World cover story titled Faithful Under Fire, a powerful piece about Oksana Sergienko, who ascended to the highest government post of any Seventh-day Adventist in Russia's history. During her years of political influence, in spite of numerous obstacles and challenges, Sergei Enko fearlessly expressed her love for God while cherishing her country, demonstrating that by God's grace, Adventists can faithfully serve both. McChesney's chronicle of Sergei Enko's remarkable rise to power takes readers from when she first moved, broke and homeless to Russia, to when she landed a finance ministry job, to her advancement to the upper echelons of government. This in spite of deep hostility on the part of many over her faith. Her sojourn ended much too soon with her death on August 30, 2011, following a battle with cancer. She was only 37. 
Sergei Enkel's legacy and influence, however, live on. Another must-read this month is The One Who Crawls by Zebron Nakubi. Nakubi tells a story of a Zimbabwe man named Judas who from birth to death never walked upright but went everywhere on his hands and knees. Through 45 years of service for God and the Adventist Church, Judas never allowed his physical disability to deter him from doing the Lord's work. This man's story blows away excuses for not following God's call to service in the face of apparent hardships that without faith may seem insurmountable. Also check out the Idea Exchange where you'll find interesting factoids about Adventist pioneers, church statistics, health nuggets, and photos of church members in action around the world. Altogether, you'll come away from reading January's Adventist World feeling inspired, spiritually rejuvenated, and better prepared to share God's message of love with those around you. Long cut off from their families and communities, lepers in China can now hope for a better future. Dan Weber explains. I'd like to take a minute and tell you about a story that we're premiering this month on our website, AdventistMission.org. I went to the country of China, which is a pretty incredible place to visit, and I kind of stumbled upon a story last minute of a young girl that has devoted her life to working with a group of people that's been marginalized pretty much by the society there in China. These are lepers. Most of them are above the age of 55, and some a lot older than that. And they uh, got the disease when they were younger, when medicine wasn't readily available to them. And uh, their bodies were ravaged by this, and most of them fled their families and the communities where they lived. And they uh, formed little communities by themselves, little communes almost, off in very, very remote areas. And uh, an Adventist businessman from Korea found out about this, and he's organized volunteers from both China and Korea to go and live and work and help these people. And the differences that are being made in their lives is just incredible, something really, really that you need to see. So I ask you to go to our website, AdventistMission.org, and take a look at the video. Now, let's hear from Megan Bronner. She has this week's Adventist social media highlights. Welcome to our first social media update of 2012. We caught up with all of you after our holiday break and we wanted to mention a few tweets from the last couple weeks. Thank you to everyone who has been giving us feedback on the new a and website on Facebook and Twitter. Please keep it up, we want to hear your reactions. Designer Brent tweeted that he appreciated the mobile version of the site. Annabelle Marquez asked us on Facebook about our plans for language translations. If you haven't checked out the new site yet, make sure to visit news.avenus.org next time you're near a computer. Also, thank you to Harvey Alvarez and Doris RVB for the positive feedback they gave us on our New Year's episode. This week, we asked what you were looking forward to the most in 2012. On Twitter, K. Bo Brun is excited to finish graduate school while Dion Rochelle is looking forward to a year of finding the joy in the small things. Patterson Joseph is grateful that God has given us another year to reach people with his gospel. Washington Adventist University tweeted that they are excited to watch their students grow, learn, and meet their goals this year. Your Sheik Sunshine says this year she will put God to the test because nothing is impossible with him. And on Facebook, Jay Apejas is hoping for the coming of the latter rain. Join our weekly discussions by visiting us on facebook.com forward slash Adventist News or twitter.com forward slash Adventist News. Religious liberty advocates are observing a troubling trend within education. We asked John Grotz for an Adventist take on teaching tolerance. We are living in a world of diversity. In our world today, there are many different religions. And in every country, you have people with different religion and we have to learn how to respect their religion and to respect people in spite of being different. There are some countries today in the world who teach children how to hate the religion of others. You know, it's no longer a school to train people to live in our modern world, but 
to hate other people. We believe as International Religious Liberty Association that the school should be a place where people learn the different religion in the world and how to respect people from different religion. As I was reading through the great hope, this caught my attention. God did listen to the cries of his servants. He gave to princes and ministers grace and courage to maintain the truth against the rulers of the darkness of this world. The Protestant reformers had built on Christ and the gates of hell could not prevail against them. Here's why this brings me hope. In the days of the Reformation, during the turmoil and the struggle and the persecution, God did listen to the prayers of his servants, and he protected them. God listens to his followers today, and he gives us grace and courage, and hell cannot prevail against us. The church's youth ministries wants young people to embrace discipleship, not just church membership. Gilbert Kanji explains the difference. It is my absolute privilege to introduce you to our year of discipleship in 2012. But make no mistake, when we say 2012 is the year of discipleship, we're not suggesting that discipleship will only be taken care of in 2012. In fact, it's our launch pad, it's our springboard into a lifetime of discipleship. Our mission statement in the youth department is uh, to lead our young people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and help them embrace his call to discipleship. Being a disciple and being a church member is different. Uh, a church member we would define it as someone who attends church regularly, subscribes to a set of teachings, but who is not necessarily transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. A disciple of Jesus is one who becomes the student of Jesus 24-7 and for life. So in the process of establishing discipleship for next year, the week of prayer will be based on discipleship. The first edition of Accent will be based on discipleship. It has a little questionnaire there where we can assess ourselves in terms of where we are at in our discipleship journey. Uh, we have Discipleship in Action, which is a 26-week uh, curriculum for youth groups a step to discipleship is a personal journal to assist our young people in developing a lifestyle of discipleship. So we're looking forward to 2012, our year of discipleship. If your New Year's resolution involves getting healthy, here's advice on the best exercise equipment you can invest in. This is the season where people are really enjoying and relaxing. It's a time to be festive, to sometimes we eat too much. We shouldn't do that. But one of the things that we tend to neglect, especially when it comes to holiday season, we take holiday from some of the important things we should be doing in our lives. We shouldn't stop praying. We shouldn't stop our daily Bible study. And the other thing we shouldn't stop doing is using our exercise equipment. And the best exercise equipment you can get is your walking shoes, your running shoes, your jogging shoes. These are so important. Exercise on a daily basis is something which is going to help you to have a happy, healthy and better festive season. How much should you be doing every day? You should be doing at least 45 minutes. That's the recommendation. 45 minutes. You may say, that's far too much. Well, get yourself a pedometer. These are available. They're cheap. They're everywhere. And you can use them. You should be doing 10,000 steps. 10,000 steps with this honestly applied to your belt every day. You can do 15 minutes of exercise walking in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon. That gives you 30 minutes a day already. Do it daily. Do it regularly. Do it with a friend. You'll really enjoy it and you will be happy. Many Adventists are welcoming the new year with prayer. We asked Janet Page to tell us how church members worldwide can join in a global prayer event this week. Operation Global Rain is a special time of doing 10 days of prayer in, in your church, at your home with some others, or even on the phone, however you can do it. But to join together for 10 days to pray. Right now we're in the middle of, of Operation Global Rain, that's January 4th through 14, 
But if you can't do it now, just do it sometime, sometime during the year. You'll find it just, it'll change your life and your church as you join together. The reason for Operation Global Reign is Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about pour, praying for the Holy Spirit to be poured out on us and change our hearts so that we can reach this world for Him. Because you want to go home, don't you? I do. We want to go home with Jesus, but we've got a world to reach. And as we pray for the Holy Spirit, that's going to make it happen. If you haven't heard about it or been able to be involved, go to uh, revivalandreformation.org. That website on there is a picture says Operation Global Rain. You click on that and you scroll down at the bottom and you'll find resources. And there are the theme sheets along with the prayer guidelines. Those prayer guidelines are wonderful. They will show you how to pray for a whole hour with somebody else or even to use them by yourself. And it also has guidelines of how to pray together with other people. You know how it can be? People pray these long, drawn-out prayers. Well, this shows you how to make it fun and interesting where you listen for God's heart and how He wants you to pray. I hope you can join us. When we come back, how some college students in the U.S. are sharing the Adventist message of hope. Welcome back. Here's Sergio Gonzalez with this week's iShare report. Welcome to iShare, where the news comes from you. We're starting our year off right with a story from Florida, sent to us by iShare reporter and pastor Michael Smith II. Five students from Adventist-run Oakwood University in Alabama spent their Christmas break passing out literature in the Daytona Beach area. Philip Link, Ruth Ralph, Aldovina Dos Santos, Smart Madagu, and Jacqueline Johnson knocked on doors, sharing their faith through books and earning money for the school year at the same time. Their materials included writings by church co-founder Ellen White and pamphlets on healthy, drug-free living. Smith said the health focus is what helped open up doors in a community where solicitors have previously been arrested. Pastor Smith is the associate pastor at Mount Calvary Seventh-day Adventist Church, the local church that was hosting these students. As always, a big thank you to our iShare reporters, and we're looking forward to hearing a lot more from you in 2012. Don't forget to visit news.avenist.org slash iShare to submit your reports. What does this week's Kids View have in store? We asked Walona Karimabadi to preview the magazine's first issue of 2012. We've got a neat column about nature and some of its mysteries, a kind of gross story about a home being invaded by bugs, and essays from other kids about the good and bad aspects of watching too much television. So stay tuned for that. And as always, you can find lots of great stuff on our website, www.kidsviewmag.org. Now, let's turn to Adventist historian David Trim. This week, disappointed Millerites established the very first Sabbath-keeping Adventist church. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On December 31, 1899, the first Hispanic SDA church began in Tucson, Arizona. Sometime in 1899, Pastor C.D.M. Williams and a student, Cole Porter, from Healdsburg College went to Tucson in the Arizona Territory as it then was. One of the doors they knocked on was that of Pastor Marcial Serna, a Methodist Episcopal minister in his late 30s, who they eventually converted. Within a few weeks of that, Serna had, in his own turn, converted all the members of his church but one, and they were all baptized together on the last day of 1899. And in the first week of January 1843, a Millerite Adventist evangelist, Joshua Goodwin, worked in the village of Washington, New Hampshire. He reported in the Millerite magazine, The Signs of the Times, that the Lord is reviving his work graciously in this section of country. Never did I witness a more powerful work of God than I have witnessed here. This was an important event for Adventist history because, by the end of 1844, through the influence of two Seventh-day Baptists, Rachel Oakes and Frederick Wheeler, more than a dozen of the disappointed Millerite congregation in Washington, New Hampshire, had become Sabbath keepers. It thus lays claim to being the site of the first Sabbatarian Adventist church in the world. And eventually, an official Seventh-day Adventist church was established there in 1862. Who knows how different Seventh-day Adventist history might have been were it not for the events of this week in 1843. Thanks for watching Adventist News Network. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. As always, you can visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next week, God bless.